Welcome to The Hopening, the place where hope is happening, with your hosts Fran Cadron and Marina Teran Manery. For more information about Fran and Marina, or to apply to be a guest on the show, please go to our website, www.hopening.com. The Hopening is for informal purposes only and is based on the research of your hosts, Fran and Marina. They, as well as their guests, are not responsible for any losses, damages, or liabilities that may arise from this podcast, which is not intended to replace any professional medical advice or care by medical professionals you are currently utilizing. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Hopening, the place where hope is happening. This is episode 114, and our special guest today with Marina and me in Alberta is another Albertan. So we're all together in the same time zone for one of the first times ever. So thank you, Catania, for being here. Catania Tominski is an international photographer and public speaker based in Edmonton, Canada. Catania shares her personal life experience life stories and the wisdom gained from her experiences, inspiring resilience and perseverance against all odds. Her recent trip to the Ukraine provided profound insights into the impact of volunteering, offering a new perspective on reality. Reflecting on her journey in Ukraine, she aims to ignite a commitment to cross-cultural empathy and inspire concrete humanitarian efforts for positive change. She's graced the TEDx stage where I saw her for the first time and continues to touch hearts with messages of hope and courage. Welcome, Catania. It's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. It's an honor to be with both of you today. Awesome. Wonderful. Catania, I look at you and I look at your website and I look at what you've accomplished. And I mean, the first thing that really comes to mind is how going into a war zone affected you as a journalist and what well, how did it change you how did it make you even cry out more for the message that you have it's interesting that you say that because as i just had my first art event showcasing all of my images i really pondered how the experience in the aftermath of going to ukraine has had such profound insights and I actually had to go really inward because living amongst this whole circumstance side by side with people sharing their experience with a language barrier and just picking up on body language alone and feeling it because I'm such a deep empath, um, coming back home and really sifting through all of that emotion, it took me a long time to even be able to showcase my photos because I didn't want to monetize on this hardship because it really is heartbreaking to know what these people are going through and continue to go through because I went home and I was able to really sift through the PTSD, the, the fact that I was away from these uh, air sirens on a daily occurrence and even like the missile strikes that did happen periodically um, while these people, they're still in it. Um, so yeah, it's been a long journey of really just sifting through all of the, the, there's the emotional feelings that I have for these people and what they're experiencing on a day to day and what they continue to go through. Even everything that's coming up on the news now, it's just, I feel like I, I wish I was almost there beside them again. Um, because you know, when we were banded together, you felt so close knit, you felt like you were able to support them emotionally. So I'm just, uh, I'm missing it so much there already. You know, as I, as you talk about it, I think about DNA calling DNA, right? You, your background are, you are Ukrainian, not immigrant, but there's background in the Ukraine in your background as well, right? So do you have family back in the Ukraine as well? Well, my family immigrated from Chernipse in like the late 1800s. I would wager that there are Tominsky lineage that's carried on. Um, when my family immigrated, they actually changed some of the lettering. So my original last name was 
T-Y-M-I-N-S-K-I. And when we immigrated, they changed the Y to the end and then the I to the second letter. So if I were to go back, I would have to find that spelling and kind of dig through the archives to see if I could find them. But we did lose contact when they did move over. I think it was just lack of technology and, you know, so many generations. Mm -hmm. It's understandable. Yeah, but I would agree with you, the genetic calling, the... Yeah, there's something like deeply woven with that, where it's like, I feel like I'm permanently tied to these people because of my experience. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Uh, so, Tanya, what, what is your story? How did you end up becoming a journalist, photojournalist, and then from there um, end up in a war zone? Yeah, so... I started my photography business um, after losing three male family members in my life, um, all within a one year span. And so I inherited a camera and through my grieving process, I ended up just capturing life in motion. And that was my greatest source of comfort and ability to connect to people because photos are so powerful. I guess we we can't really appreciate a photo as time kind of goes on it appreciates in value and you just you never know how powerful that moment is as like time progresses and maybe we lose someone or something of that nature. So I ended up pursuing it originally being a creative initially um and then yeah just going full on working with um in weddings mu working with musicians etc but then in the midst of covid you know, everything kind of shrunk. Everyone was kind of in this like dormant state. So I kind of really went inward and I had this deaf at this need to creatively express myself, you know, after so much time of being dormant. And I did quite a bit of freelance work, working with different creatives on so many different projects. I actually photographed Lucha Libre wrestlers in Mexico a few years prior, just really spontaneous kind of projects that I wanted to really expand my portfolio in. And in turn, in the aftermath of COVID, I ended up getting offering offered a photojournalism position to work with mothers and women in distress in Ukraine specifically. And for me, it was something that I, I just couldn't turn down. I knew that I wanted to give back. I felt this yeah, creative need to do something beyond myself. And I've always known that there's something really powerful in giving from the hand. And it just was something that I just immediately said yes. And I was like, I'll deal with the rest after. So. And nobody said, forget it. Don't go. Like, didn't your mom go sit you down and say, you're not yeah. going? Yeah. It, well, I said yes in the moment when I was offered. And then all of a sudden it was a reality check. And I, I kept my circle small in regards to who I shared it with because I didn't want to get talked out of it. I knew in my heart I wanted to go. There was just this calling and I, I can't really put it into words. I think we experienced that only so many times in our lifetime. And so, yeah, I, I think the reality check really came in. I had very vivid dreams of like the potential harm, um, but it just felt like the reward was so much greater than the risk. Mm -hmm. I will yeah. also say too, um, one of the organizers that had, you know, promoted this or offered this opportunity to me, he also had gone back into Ukraine as well. So there was a lot of like understanding that the circumstances, everything was contained in that moment too. It wasn't like staying in Warsaw and only interviewing people that got off the train. They had gone back. So I was trusting that if there were people and Ukrainians going back home, the situation must have stabilized. So, so, and um, as a motivational speaker, what is it? What is your message? My message is persevering and not giving up on your purpose. Um, I, I feel like when we give to others, we give so much more to ourselves in the process and not to lose sight of that. Um, in my Ted talk, everything that comes full circle to me is kindness is the most powerful tool that we have with each other. And in a very like technologically advanced world, our connections are the most valuable, our in-person contacts and connections we have with each other. And Tanya, I encourage our viewers to watch that TED talk because um, 
you know, there were several different speakers and all of that. But for some reason, your speech, you know, your TED Talk really stood out. I mean, I'm getting goosebumps when I talk about it, right? Because there was so much power in the message and the way you said it was so encouraging and inspiring and hopeful, right? It really was hope-filled. Um, so you talked about how you photographed women and mothers, um, but also people across the board. So uh, we've got some photos. I know that we're going to go through those as well. Um, could you explain a little bit about why you chose these photos? I mean, I'm sure you took hundreds, right? I'm sure you took hundreds. So why was it these photos in general before, you know, Marina will start this live show? I got to double check again, which ones I sent. Um, but for me, the ones that I have presented, I know really convey and tell a story of what had happened there. And even in my experience, like I said, I worked with women and mothers, but it was, um, it affected everyone. So it was just point and shoot and capture everything you can. I'll also relay as well. And I was very proud to share this with um, my guests yesterday at the event. Every single photo I took of every single person, I asked for consent before I took it. I didn't want to just capture anyone for my own personal gain. I felt very connected to these people, really wanting to share their story, but for them to feel comfortable with me capturing them as I navigated this whole new terrain. Um, but yeah, the, the photos include wreckages. They include pretty much living amongst sandbags, tire jacks, just living amongst this constant reminder of war. There's check stops everywhere you go. There was daily curfews. There was air sirens. And yeah, obviously the, the constant attacks, they had an app that had, um, they would, it would relay what region the, the missile was targeted or targeting. So who needed to find coverage and like, you know, shelter. So um, a lot of these photos really reflect that. Um, I'm actually in the process of doing complete write-ups on each image because I really want people to understand the meaning behind each one. So I'm looking forward to sharing that with you. Mm -hmm. okay, on that awesome. note, let's share this so that we can, um, so that you can talk us through that. So this is the first one you sent us. Yeah, so that one's my bio photo, so we can bypass yeah. that. Yeah, so this one, um, I spent an entire day wandering around downtown Kiev. I had interviewed just previously a mother and a daughter, which probably is included in this as well. But I stumbled upon these two girls and you could hear them faintly in the distance. And they were probably finished school for the day. Um, they had just used this public piano and just started playing. And from my understanding, it was songs of hope. Um, trying to inspire people because I, you know, obviously them expressing themselves in that way was helping get them through, but it was beautiful. I, I have some video on it as well, but um, it was really inspiring, even though I didn't know the words entirely. It was a really beautiful moment. What, what caught my attention when I looked at this was expression, like the girl playing piano. If you look at her face, that moment is so raw, it's so beautiful, but also this could be downtown Calgary. It You would never guess that around them, they are actually in a war zone. And mm -hmm. then the third thing is the music must go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that, that was what was so powerful as well is the fact that people just got up every single day despite it all and just kept persevering. They just, the, the level of resiliency of these people, it's so inspiring to have witnessed that. Beautiful. Okay, we're going to move on to the next one. Yeah, so yeah. These, this was the uh, mother that I had interviewed that morning. Um, her husband was killed in the war. He was struck by a missile. And it took a lot of strength for her to show up that day. Um, she was holding back tears. And uh, I sat her down and we just kind of were asking kind of like a little bit of the history. Her husband was a photographer and he was in asked to go to war. So he was serving his country. And this little girl absolutely loved me taking her photo. She was mm -hmm. so excited to be around me, but she had no idea why she was in front of me that day. 
And so, um, yeah, there's a few, there's another image of her that I have that I might have included there, but um, she was very inspiring to me. I looked into her eyes and I was, I'm very curious to see what her future holds. Okay. Yeah, downtown Kiev as well. Um, sandbags, tire jacks, tank, um, uh, tire, or tank jacks everywhere dispersed. And then in this downtown center, there was um, beaten up tanks that were no longer no longer functional. This was a missile that they had deemed safe to display. Um, and yeah, this gentleman, it still blows my mind. I, I question, you know, kind of where he was at on a mental level, on an emotional level, but he sat on that missile every single day. And I remember I have another photo of him where he's got this like notebook and he's writing on it, but it's that's not the focal point. It's like kind of, it's, he's in kind of like the, that, the side angle of what the initial shot was, but he went and sat on that spot every single day. Like it was a park bench. You know, yeah. What is a tank jack? What, what do you mean? It's like, um, one of those like steel crosses that sit that block, uh, tanks from passing. Cause it's so heavy and it'll disrupt the wheel. Yeah. Yeah. So this one, another thing as well, you know, a lot of the Ukrainians were telling me, we wish that you were here not during the war because the city mm -hmm. is so beautiful, but there's all these incredible landmarks and all of them bubble wrapped. Just there's, um, there's actually a organization, a European organization that partially funded this. I can't remember the name of it, but yeah, they also came to support. So they wrapped these pieces of history just to protect them. Um, really interesting. Um, so yeah, I was wandering, you know, around the city and I, I don't even know how well this wrapping did to protect it other than just like small little bits of shrapnel. I mean, if a missile hit it, it's, it's out, but yeah, a lot of these buildings were covered with concrete and sandbags and just boarded up so that they could protect the, some of the, um, some of the pieces, the statues that were scattered around the downtown core. It's very good to to zoom into this. I don't know if you guys can see as I'm zooming in, yeah. but it's yeah. you can see it so clearly how it's an attempt to protect it. But yeah, I agree. If a missile would hit that, mm -hmm. that's not gonna. So this gentleman, I can't remember his name off the top of my head. Um, it was very interesting. I lived in a hotel house while I was there, and I. In the room next to mine was a gentleman. He was from um, Chicago and he came to, as a documentarian to capture everything he could in regards to the ward, create a documentary. And he got in touch with this guy. And this gentleman, he has a major motion picture Ukrainian movie in particular that I know made Ukrainian Netflix. And his background is he was kind of like a gangster, I think in like the 90s. And when in the war in Crimea broke out, he served his country and his whole life changed and his wife and his daughter died. And yeah, his he, he really was a very interesting person to spectate. He was very grateful for the opportunity to be interviewed. Um, yeah, so it was a separate team that we had brought on, um, and I just ended up taking some photos while they were doing the interview. There's another image as well, um, I would love to show at a later point, where he has his arm leaning up against the table. You see the wedding ring, but he has a chess set right next to him with a few of the pawns being played. And there's a, even a Ukrainian flag that goes with it. And it's a very powerful image because it shows like the the need to go to war to protect to serve for his country but yet he's got this wedding band as if like he doesn't want to repeat history all over again you know losing family or potentially you know being killed in the war and breaking up his family as well so he was a, a very lovely person to interview he was very um inclusive he was part of a separate um group of soldiers we there was like Americans that were with him serving under him and they were like a separate military form to protect. And I think that was very common as well. There's not just armed forces and Ministry of Defense. There are other military groups that serve 
and funded separately that serve as well and go to the front too. So in this photograph, for anyone who's on a podcast version of our show, we see a man who's in a, in a brown camouflage and behind him is a flag. And um, I'm just wondering if you know, like I, I like the, I really like the image because his head is kind of centered in the, in a, in a rain, kind of like a, a half halo. circle. Yeah, a half circle halo. Is there, um, what is the flag, if you know? And I just, I'm just wondering why you chose to, to take that photo that way. I, I really liked how it formed and shaped around his head. Um, even like the light coming in, shining on his face. I really love the angle of it. I'm not familiar. I'm assuming it is, um, it could be actually the Carpathian Mountains because that mountain range, I feel like it might be more of like a Western Ukrainian flag, but it obviously is a Ukrainian flag because it incorporates both those colors, but I'm not actually fully sure. But um, even when we were doing the interview, like he felt very adamant hanging that one in particular too, but yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. And so very close to um, the same center core, um, lots of people out on a daily basis with their kids. Um, that was the same morning that we had an attack happen um, in the downtown center. And yeah, like within three or four hours, right? Mothers are just taking their kids out and the kids, shoot, these kids were just jumping in there, having the best time of their life. And like, I, I, I would wager like if they really knew or grasped what was happening. And so it was a very powerful moment just to see these girls playing, having the best time ever. And like the moms are talking in the background, kind of like probably all their fears and concerns. Um, so yeah, it was a really interesting moment to capture just so many people like walking around the downtown center, despite that something, an attack just had happened. Like missiles literally had passed over Kiev in its entirety. So Catania, did you find that, um, that there were very few men on the streets? There or, were still quite a few. There, there, were, were. there were still. Yeah. So even though there's war and men are going to war, fathers are going to war, yeah. we still have, we still have a lot of men around. Yes. I, there is a rule of thumb too. I believe that if there is a father that has three or more kids, I think they're exempt from going and serving. Um, they can legally leave. I actually just chatted with a gentleman, Andre. He's in Calgary. He's starting a Ukrainian magazine and he was exempt. He was able to leave. But yeah, lots of men still wandering um, and kind of just waiting to see if they would be called to serve. Um, and many did it. Like you could go free of choice as well. There was um, a girl that was living in the same house. She was the niece of the gentleman that owned the property that I was staying in the, the time I was there and her best friend and her graduated, but her best friend's boyfriend volunteered and he unfortunately had died only within a month prior. So it was bittersweet. He was meant to graduate with them. Um, and so I think there was a lot of those men that wanted to serve if they had to, but weren't the first to line up. You know, I, I can only imagine like even just living in that constant contemplation of whether they will be called to serve or not. So, yeah, still a lot of men working hard and just waiting, waiting to see. Okay, so this is the last one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just day to day life. Um, a lot of these photos really showcase a lot of the Soviet buildings that still mm -hmm. um, a lot of the architecture that still exists there. Um, and so, yeah, I just tried to document as much as I could of like, just how everything looks vastly different there. And a lot of buildings obviously still intact. There's a lot of different uh, places that were damaged as well. But yeah, a lot of people just still like holding space there, just kind of waiting. So, very, very so well I love how you have given us um the 
the common stuff that's still going on, right? You, if I were to look at these pictures without you telling me what was going on, I wouldn't know that this is a war zone. Um, however, the dialogue tells me so much more. And I, I looked at your website and the photographs on your website are quite profound. So we've got a snapshot of your photos here, but your website, tell us a little bit about what you've put up on your website just to get a contrast. Jump over there. Yeah, sure. feel free. Um, yeah, so I just have added quite a bit more as well to it, which just same thing, it just adds a little bit more context. Um, yeah, and that's the thing that's so powerful about photography as well is like you don't really know until you're explained the like emotional depth of it all. Right. Yeah. And uh, I thought it was really important. Like I, I always tell people as well, cause they're like, how was your experience? Cause we all get this big idea of what, you know, a war zone looks like, but I, I lightly say, I almost had like the princess tour because I was escorted by armed forces, ministry of defense out of the kindness of their heart. They're talking to, you know, check stop attendees that are looking at my passport, thinking that I'm Ukrainian and wondering why it's a Canadian passport. Um, but yeah, I didn't go right to the front and I'm so grateful that I didn't, you know, there was still that de degree of separation, but still like you're only 30 kilometers out. So it really like, if things get bad, they get bad fast. Um, I know another photographer, um, his name is Patrick. I've been in touch with him quite a bit and he, uh, he ended up winning a UNICEF award, but he literally took it a degree further. Like he's on the front, he's right there, like right after an incident happens. I was very lucky. Um, I didn't see any bodies. It was nothing of that nature. Um, I feel like everything that I captured was enough to really convey the message. Like I said, the emotional depth of it all, I think speaks a lot in itself. Um, so yeah, like this was all around the Kiev area and the surrounding regions of um, Irpin and Bucha. So Katanya, as I'm still scrolling through some of the photos here, I I want to talk about perspective because we sit here in our cozy, warm, peaceful homes in North America, and we know that there is this war going on. And what we hear filtered through the media is not necessarily what you have experienced. So how would you explain to us exactly what... How is it different from what we perceive? Yeah, and one story that I shared in my TED talk was when a week into my journey in Ukraine, I did wake up to that incident where the missiles um, had hit an apartment building. And there was like a few different ideas of kind of what was really happening there. Like people were wagering that it was gonna hit the British embassy, but if it would have hit an embassy, it would have started an outright war. Some people say that the missiles were flimsy, like, cause a lot of the gear is older. A lot of the, the missiles are older, right? And um, for me in my experience after that and reading the news write up after experiencing it, it's such a micro version of what it is. Like it doesn't capture the emotional depth of it all, what these people are experiencing. Um, even when it came back, like, a lot of the Ukraine stuff was still at kind of at the top. And then now it's kind of slowly dimmed and it's barely talked about at all. Um, another scenario that happened as well as I was in the region of Irpin and I was right behind an apartment building that was just shattered glass and just a kind of uh, just covered field where a lot of bodies were because everyone in this building had died. And there was a major news channel that came and was like, we're going to document all of this while the locals were burying these bodies. And they packed up, they left. The next day they come back and they say, well, our footage wasn't that good. Could you unbury them and get better? We can get better footage. So yeah, I mean, even that in itself expresses the lack of really expressing what's actually happening here like the heart of it all what are these people experiencing that it 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 really shocked me so 
Yeah, the shock of empathy is or the lack of empathy is is it's almost just that photo of it's crazy. Yeah, and crazy. so this is this, this is must the, be the little girl that you talked about, right? Yeah, and what was so powerful too, I saw the perfect opportunity. She's standing there, she's really grateful just to have her photo taken. Oh. And we were trying to get her to smile, but I was like, you know, don't like it's not a happy moment because all of these people behind and there is a wall that spans meters and these are all faces of the fallen soldiers wow. and her father was one of them and you were there you were there fairly close to the beginning of the war am yes. i correct the war started february 24th i believe 2022 and i arrived june 2022 so just several, a few months later, and there were already that many that were, had passed away. Oh my goodness. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. And so obviously some of the incredible statues that they have, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. gorgeous, a gorgeous city to wander. Right. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. So um, Katanya, if you have an opportunity to do this again with you, I'm going to stop sharing now. Oh, don't. There's one photograph I want, please. There's one of a, a wedding at, that you showed at the TED Talk. Right, right. That is, that was my favorite, that, that, the wedding photo. Yeah, so if you have time, I'd love to. If you can explain about the wedding yeah. and, um, yeah, That's that the bride. That one was the focal point of my art show yesterday. I I kept it in good lighting, and everyone, some women were saying it was a feminist statement. Some people, some all the guys were like blown away. Um, yeah. So there's another one of uh, this couple specifically getting married. What had happened was I was touring around, and I was uh, with this commander, and he said or general rather, I was touring with a general. And then this was a commander that pushed back the Russians in Irpin. And yeah, it, that was his neighborhood that he literally lives in. And so he was running all of these men sleeping on the floor of these buildings, securing, you know, this, this area. And he had, you know, was in love. He had a whole life, you know, he had his own hobbies, he had everything and he was called to action. And so after he pushed everything back, you know, he was ready to serve to go back to the front. And so this general said, hey, I have this uh, couple. They're getting married in three days. Would you like to photograph it? Immediate yes. It was a courthouse wedding. Um, I remember an air siren went off. Well, everything shuts down at that point. So we were waiting outside the, um, you know, it wasn't even like necessarily even a courthouse. It was like a registry with like this little private room. And so we're waiting outside and we finally get in and they're popping champagne and we're driving down the streets and they've got the just married sign and they're screaming. And then uh, people down the street were honking their horn. And then his men came to join in uniform as well. Mm -hmm. And I actually have an image at some point. It'll be funny to share, but I'm wearing this dress because I bought this in uh, Ukraine while I was there. And I'm with all of these men in uniform with their masks and everything and their helmets and their guns. And I'm just this little Ukrainian girl with the camera capturing this wedding day. And there's one image that I find so powerful of these two, because you can see this glisten in his eye and he had gone through so much. Um, I toured with him around the entire area that he secured. And I know that he'd seen a lot. He experienced way too much in one's lifetime and to see him happy for one moment. Uh -huh. Yes. It was so beautiful. And literally 48 hours later, honeymoon's done. He's back to the front. So it was uh -huh. a really, really on like such a huge honor to have captured that for them and kind of encapsulate. I, I feel like I really became an international wedding photographer when I captured this day. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah incredible okay so back to my question if you can do it again will you yes mm. i would mm -hmm. i am monitoring the situation i have been offered so one instant i met uh or i interviewed and chatted with this um professor from nipro which nipro is a 
kind of central Western um, city in Ukraine that's been absolutely decimated. And he came to Alberta. I believe he stays mainly in Calgary. He gathers drones and he goes to the front. And he's got a very strong stance. And he literally said, if you want to come, he's like, I will bring you to the front. And I was like, I'm fine. I was like, I'm, I'm good. I don't need that for my portfolio. I'm not, that's not my role. But I, um, before I did my TED talk, I ironically went to TEDx U Alberta, which is in Edmonton where I live. And the MC was a girl from Dnipro and she came to Canada, came to Edmonton to study um, right before the war started. I interviewed her and she felt very ostracized from her family and all that she knows because she was one step away. Like she wasn't part of this experience. Um, so she felt very like segregated from them to a degree, but she now has gone back. She goes to Portugal and she currently has a place in Kiev and she's already offered. She's like, if you want to come, she's like, I have dozens of people you can interview. And so I pondered, you know, would I... I wouldn't go on a whim. I want to be very calculated. I want to be very mindful. I'm not worried about the physical risk. I'm more about more worried about the emotional risk in it all. Um, and so, you know, even pondering the prospects of maybe doing a GoFundMe, I almost don't feel right to do that. I almost want to continue to share my prints and keep sharing my work and build up to that as well. Um, but I do want to build on my portfolio. I do want to tell the story of this level of resiliency. These people are literally living in this rubble of all this wreckage. People are walking home with groceries. And I want to showcase that. I want to share with people that I'm like, wow, people like literally living in rubble. People having their whole entire life and they don't have anywhere to go. They have elderly parents and grandparents to take care of. They have, you know, their children that they might be have shared custody with. They, you know, have a, maybe a mortgage to pay or a business to operate. Like they, they're choosing not to leave even for their own, um, you know, uh, democracy reasons as well. Like they want to stand together and not leave behind their people. Um, so it, to capture that it's, it's really, really powerful. And necessary. I want to say how necessary it is because when you listen to the news, you get, well, at the beginning, we would get more, right? There were like maybe three minutes on the news about the Ukraine. And now there's very little because there's another war in the world that's getting more attention right now. But it doesn't mean that one hasn't gone away. It, it's still there. And the people, the women, the men, the moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas and children, of course, are still living that. But what I love so much about your slideshow and your and is just like you said the resilience it's like the, it's almost like a what in that bride's face right in that bride's face there was almost when she was kissing her husband it was like a defiance it was like I am having my wedding day and nobody's gonna stop me because we've all, I don't know if you're married Tanya but you know we've been married some of us have had children that are married and we know how much planning there is in a wedding. It's, there's a lot of planning. So it's like, I am having my wedding and nobody's taking it away from me. And there is so much resilience and hope and just, you're, not, you're, you're trying to mess this up for me and I'm not going to let you. So I, I just love that. I love how you show that in your photographs. I think that, yeah, that's that's definitely where it comes from is people are still fighting, saying, I deserve to have a life. I deserve to be happy. You, It's it's incredible. Katanya, yeah. we always like to end with what is your message of hope? I, I want to inspire people that we're more resilient than we can ever imagine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we need and each other. We and so if we were to, I mean, there's government, non-government non organizations and there's government organizations and there's all kinds of people collecting money. Like you said that you were, you thought about doing a GoFundMe and decided not to, but how can we on the other side 
you know, it's still the same planet. It's still the same world. You've got the same DNA of some of those people over there. How can we help if we wanted to help? Like, because we care about people. We don't care about the politics. Yeah. For me personally, a big part of the hope that I want to inspire as well is like giving from the hand itself. And maybe you, we don't all have the opportunity to go to the the actual conflict area to offer help. But I mean, even for myself, like I just did my art show and I want part of the proceeds to go to a charitable cause. Um, There's one of which that I highly recommend in Edmonton, Alberta. It's called Free Store YEG. It's a like value village, I would say for Ukrainian newcomers, really powerful. Um, But also I have a girl that I'm in like good contact with that escaped Kharkiv, which is just, it's right on the border of Russia. There's nothing left. And she's uh, building life here. And she's actually the girl that does my nails. And she does an amazing job, beautiful soul, so grateful, so happy. And it's, I want to give part of those proceeds to her directly from the hand because I know how impactful it would be. And so I think when we see people that are newcomers, we can make such a difference just in our own country, in our own neighborhood itself, even just a smile. It doesn't have to be. Sorry, can you spell that, that um, nonprofit, the the one you just said? Yeah, free store. Why? Yes. Okay. Why? Yay. Y-E-G, the Edmonton. Dot com or Air, is there airport a code Y A G. Yeah. Is yeah. there a website for it as well? I believe so. Um, I'm sure that if you punch that in, it'll come up right away. But awesome. it was beautiful. I actually had done a little tour there and I was chatting with the girl that runs it, and it felt like I was back in Ukraine because of the language. And even it became a community center where a lot of them will work there and volunteer, but it's a it's a center for people to have community. Um, so it's, it's spaces like that, that I think are really important. You know, I appreciate Canada so much for the little pockets of communities. I know it can be a little fragmented at times, but it's, it's important that people have that sense of belonging as well. And so there are organizations that I know that have that premise as well. And so I think those are the ones that can make a big difference is those people now are supporting each other and they're able to kind of work through that. And if they need anything like you know, they can lean upon each other, but it's, it's a good starting point. Thank you. Beautiful. And then um, your website is kataniadesign.com. Mm-hmm. So your name, K-A-T-A-N-Y-A design.com. So if people want to look up more about you, if you're in the Edmonton area, I'm pretty sure if you need photos, Katania would be your girl. Mm-hmm. And um, Katania, thank you so much for sharing all of this with us so captivating and um, heartfelt and uh, thank you for serving the people of Ukraine and the way you do and telling the story really really appreciate that thank you very much for having me yeah and if you um, appreciated what we brought to you today those of us that are viewing or if you're listening on a podcast please click to subscribe So thank you, Catania. It was wonderful to have you here, to see you again. It's like I get to have you all to myself, not with a whole audience of people. So thank you so much for joining me and us. Thank you, Fran. Thank you, Marina. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. We will see you next time with more hope.